world of e-commerce can be tricky, and that's why you need the experts to help take you to the next level. This is Delivering E-Commerce, and this is Chris Parsons. Everyone, welcome to the third episode of 2022. I'm so excited to be able to bring to you a guest who I met through a contact, uh, Michael LeBlanc, a couple of years ago now. Uh, so, hey, Michelle, Thank you for joining us today on Delivering E-Commerce. I'm so excited to have you. We definitely built a rapport on our trip to Ireland, um, and it was a, such a great way for us to, we've actually never met before, which was surprising, uh, to just create a rapport on such a fun trip with Michael and, and talk about e-commerce and the industry. And um, thank you for joining us. Uh, I can't wait for you to tell your story. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. Great. So um, officially, Michelle is Michelle Reed Kulik, and I, I hope I, I'm terrible with last names. So hopefully I nailed that. Um, and uh, so if we can get started, Michelle, I would love for you to tell your journey to the audience of, um, you know, your ups and downs in the career and where you are today and talk about even this moving across the country, which I just found out a couple of days ago. So love to hear that story. Sure. Uh, yeah, maybe we'll we'll start in the present. Um, I did recently move from Toronto to Kelowna, so right across the, the country from the hustle and bustle of the big city to a little bit of a sleepier, um, but burgeoning, actually, um, space, which is uh, Kelowna, BC. It was a lifestyle move for our family, uh, and I'm very fortunate that I uh, run and operate my own digital consulting business. So I was able to bring that and a key roster of clients with me to the mountainside overlooking uh, Lake Okanagan. <laughs> so it's, it's a big move, um, no small undertaking to move two teenagers uh, out of their comfort zones, pack everyone in a trailer and a truck and, <laughs> and make, the, make the journey. Um, but we had a plan and we executed on that plan. Um, I think part of it, you know, there's the, the lifestyle piece, the personal piece, um, the business piece. I'd always been um, in search of how to make these two things jive. This uh, recent move definitely brings all of that together. I'm super grateful I get to work with amazing clients uh, and helping them solve their, their digital transformation and their e-commerce uh, solutions. Um, and... You know what got me here was a lot of a lot of hard work, a lot of thinking, and and a lot of really great experience over the years. I started my career way back when um, on the digital marketing side. I actually started on the agency side, mm -hmm. and um, what that allowed me to do is really understand client needs, but also understand the back end, how things got done. I switched years to be client side at another point in my career. So I was now starting to put together both the pieces of the puzzle. The commonality in all of it was I was a database marketer first and foremost. So I could understand how to get into that data. And the data was the conversation piece either with, um, with the client or with the agency yeah. on the agency side. Uh, so that, um, that really just set me up through my career. And I have to think back now, kind of going from uh, agency side to client side and across industries and really being part of the watching digital change um, and all of the infrastructure around it change before our very eyes and having to adjust accordingly. Yeah, and before you jump into the rest of your story, I just want to touch on the point of, <clears throat> of you know, the foundational piece of analytics and data and, and being able to have the chops to, uh, to talk to those those numbers and bring out insights i actually <clears throat> excuse me i have a a job posting that's going to be going up for insights and uh, research analyst and um i actually was doing some pre-screening of some candidates uh, a couple of weeks ago and one of the conversations was where they were coming with a, a great background in in marketing but they weren't sure about going into the insights and research component for me for analytics. And what I told them was my first job with Walmart was research and insights, analyzing the flyers. And I don't think I would be as strong today with e-commerce and building out PL and, you know, 
budgets and all of that if I didn't have the background in the two years of experience understanding numbers. And I thought it was critical to my success. And a lot of people are like, oh, they don't want to jump, dump in, jump into it and understand those components. But if you got to understand margin and sales and numbers, it's critical to have that foundation. So uh, much like you, that's that was where I started is really to just blossom from from good um, foundational experience in numbers. 100%. Um, and I'm finding now too, just jumping in, it's one thing to um, you spend months and months in doing heavy lifting and building fantastic strategies, but to be able to just dig in and uh, do test, test and learn uh, mm -hmm. and actually measure the results of that testing and learning requires a really strong found foundation in just understanding, um, yeah, analytics and the impact. Yeah. That's great. And then, <clears throat> so you, you, um, on the consulting side now, you have a couple of clients. I did consulting for a little bit as well. Obviously, I'm back in retail, so I wasn't successful at it. But uh, <laughs> really, what, uh, what I did enjoy was that challenge of every unique client brought excitement and new thought process. And every day was, was a new challenge where with the traditional retail job, yes, there's those challenges. But the dynamics of who you're talking to each time, how you speak to them, how you educate them is quite different with every single client. Can you tell me a little bit about how you're how you're dealing with that opportunity? Mm -hmm. I can try for sure. I think um, one of the key things that I do bring to the to the table as a consultant in my role is having had that hands on experience. I think that's really valued. So if I can look across the table or across the Zoom screen at a client who um, and I really understand what shoes they're walking in, uh, what to that just helps our work a lot more. So um, it's not theoretical. It's not just a bunch of um, empty strategy. It's really founded on helping them be successful in their roles. So I find that where I can be almost an extension to their team, it's a really valuable uh, position to be in to help them navigate uh, not only the kind of the, the what to do, but the how to do it. Mm. Um, getting, ex getting, gaining insights and helping them um, with stakeholder input or stakeholder alignment, uh, really showcasing where they're succeeding um, with you know, their struggles or challenges, helping highlight some of those wins um, and, and communicate those to the broader team. Again, just having walked in those folks' shoes really is helpful. Yeah, yeah, in building those bridges. One of the things I appreciate about you from our trip uh, to Ireland, and I, I was observing all of the people uh, as I normally do, but with you, what I thought was was really interesting was you didn't necessarily want to be the first to speak and answer questions. Mm -hmm. um, you you could have at any point, but what I really appreciated was the the thought process that you put into your response, and you made sure that it was was thoughtful, respectful, and very clear and concise. Whereas a lot of people, and I'm guilty of this myself, as um, soon as somebody asks a question, I want to be the problem solver and get it onto the table as fast as possible. But you you wanted to either qualify on that question, dig deeper before you actually gave your your perspective. And, and I think that's a skill set that is very, um, very hard for for people to develop. And uh, I'm sure your clients are, are really appreciative of that right now. Mm -hmm. Thanks, Chris. Yeah, I think it, it's important. It's actually um, a few of the key projects I've been working on have been helping folks break down silos. Mm -hmm. And that involves using that exact same skill set. Like that's what I'm finding. One of the biggest obstacles um, to some team success is they've kind of got the data and analytics in one group, for example, the marketing campaign sits in another with branding, maybe. Um, and then you've got maybe a loyalty group or another group that's uh, separate yet again. So being able to understand where everybody's coming from, analyze and synthesize those findings, and then play it back to the team in a, a well thought out way that actually builds like a, a playbook or a roadmap for them is really um, it's people are finding very helpful. And I love that kind of work. That's great. And I know I interrupted you with some questions, but let's get back to your journey because it's been you've done some amazing things. I would love for the audience to hear. Thanks. Um, yes, yeah, I dig back in my memory. As I said, I, I started my career um, really in, on the agency side. I worked for some of the the first uh, 
digital agencies in Canada, Blast Radius back in the day, um, and also Henderson Bass, really um, cut my, my chops, uh, so to speak, on, on um, just, yeah, really cutting edge um, digital stuff at the time. But the, the fundamental a consistent piece has been this customer centricity. Uh, so after the agency side, I mentioned that I went client side. Uh, I worked on really um, big brands. I worked with GlaxoSmithKline on the pharma on pharmaceutical. I also worked with uh, Ministry of Health uh, back in the day, um, mm -hmm. helping them launch their first ever social media strategy. Um, so as you can see, I sort of touched on agency side, I've gone from different industries. And then when you and I met, um, I had come out of uh, at Law Blah. I had uh, helped build the PC, what was then the PC Plus program at Law Blah. I built up uh, digital marketing. I built up the, the digital center of excellence uh, for Law Blah companies. Uh, rebuilt all of their social media strategies as well. Built the, did the heavy lifting on infrastructure and rebranded uh, President's Choice uh, during my tenure there. We met at, I uh, was at Pizza Pizza. Yeah. Um, so what might sound like a lot of like all over the place from pharmaceutical to retail to quick service retail, like in that constant has been an understanding of customer and understanding of the data analytics that will help move things forward. Um, and then marrying that with the business needs and then being able to speak the jargon and translate mm -hmm. it, like you said a couple of moments ago, into a way that um, can earn the, the sort of the trust and respect and understanding of the senior stakeholders. Uh, and I love that about you, the diversity of your career. And it wasn't just into, like myself, just into retail and a little bit of consulting here or there. But you were able to, to test and learn. And, and really, what I love about folks like yourself to have the confidence to do that is you're, you're gaining a greater perspective because every industry is slightly different. There's commonalities between them, but uh, you learn so much by testing out some of these other these other avenues. And it just makes you a stronger marketer later on because you've, you've got a perspective, especially as you keep saying, you know, you're trying to be customer centric, but there's nuances from each of those industries that you're able to pick up and best practices that you can bring to life. And, and now as a client um, getting your services, that's a wealth of knowledge to be able to tap into. It is, and it, it, it um, thank you. <laughs> I say that humbly, but just, to, it is interesting to be able to go from one industry to another. There are some industries that um, I've touched on that are really uh, not willing to hire people out of their, their industry. Um, financial services was one of them that I stumbled upon back in the day. And I found that really perplexing because I think that someone is uh, bring so much more value and wealth of experience and exposure and perspective to the table yeah. if they can um, if they have worked in different industries. So let's talk a little bit about the work you did with uh, Loblaws and the PC brand. And specifically, you said you you helped with the social. Social has been changing dramatically over the last mm -hmm. couple of years. I mean, there's everyone is still social and engaging on different platforms, but the dynamics is. You know, when we launched our first set of social was Facebook and then um, Instagram came along, Pinterest, and now it's just it's endless. And I think my son's on something called Discord and I, I've probably spent 10 minutes trying to figure out what that is. Um, but uh, but ultimately, when you when you took that on and what were some of the KPIs, what were the metrics that you were driving to succeed with a social like a lot of folks are just like TikTok's exploding, go put up an ad there. But you know it's more than that it's not it's how you engage with that audience you, and you may choose in certain uh, social channels not even to participate 100% um i think one of the well one of the key measures was sanity <laughs> um because for exactly that reason i i felt like i was playing whack-a-mole a lot um and i think all of us feel like that with the as you're saying that continually emerging and evolving social ecosystem there's just always some new shiny channel so how do we contain and maintain and sustain uh, sort of um, our, 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 our sanity um, by not just chasing after all of these shiny objects um, and reacting? So I went back to core fundamentals of actually building out a social strategy. You know, who are we looking to connect with? 
um, may not be the person that is actually interested in us. You know, our target market might be very different than folks who are responding to us. Um, and building out social channel strategies, building out content strategies. So really back to the fundamentals so that we were able to pivot uh, whenever there was either a new question, a new channel in question, um, or just be really well prepared to respond to what was happening in front of us. So it was a lot, um, and this has been consistent um, throughout uh, my career in terms of all the social media guidance I've provided is to just really get back to that fundamental core strategy piece. Way too many uh, people are caught up in the shiny objects, the shiny object syndrome and chasing the next and the next and the next. When you have that fundamentals and um, that you can then decide when you know, TikTok com comes along, you think, yeah, that does fit with what we want to do. And yes, we will create content for that, but it has to be a sustainable strategy that you're entering into. Yeah, you bring up a great point and it's a lesson I still struggle with myself. I know my team is probably listening to this podcast and they're laughing at not chasing the next thing or they call it the squirrel syndrome where it's like, mm -hmm. a like I'm always looking for, you know, the next evolution. And I, I have this sense of urgency on everything that we do. And it's like just knowing when to, to, to pause, make sure we get the foundations of the programs and the priorities done. And then you can take that uh, next approach and test and learn on another topic. But if if you spread everybody too thin, you're not accomplishing anything. Um, you talked about this social um, and the way you were leveraging it. And it's, I think social for the most part started really as a, as a branding tool and also as a customer engagement mm -hmm. tool where you can, you know, from a customer service perspective, um, be proactive or respond to any of the negative comments that were coming in uh, much, much more so than having phone calls. But today's age of social is now far greater because it's it's a selling tool. Now you can do live live selling or you can do social commerce. Um, and it's it's playing such a significant role. I think the last stat I saw was about 30, 35 percent of e-commerce sales are being influenced from from social now. And, and that's that's way up before when it was just a, a brand or a customer service tool. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. The evolution has been remarkable. And I think um, I would actually say that as as it has evolved, it hasn't necessarily changed. It's just added on. So it's still a branding tool. It's still a customer service tool. It's still a communications and engagement tool. Um, and so we just like add, add, add. Uh, pizza, pizza, we made some fantastic inroads into using social commerce. Mm -hmm. uh, it was pretty cool to be able to see the direct correlation between seeing a, an ad in your feed um, and ordering a pizza. And we did um, actually just a, a ton of great work with a fantastic agency partner where we moved very far away from the traditional target and push to multiple creative variations uh, for multiple um, stages in, in the uh, consumer funnel, right from awareness straight down to the bottom of the funnel and played around with um, upwards of 60 variations of creative in market at any one given time for any one initiative. That's pretty cool. Yeah, I've done some of that stuff. A company, I'm drawing a blank. I think uh, Got Vantage was a company I was exploring at the time and uh, you would create your taglines and their artificial intelligence would basically then pre-populate about a hundred different versions of an ad. And um, ultimately what would happen is throughout your spend, it would start to refine on what ads are driving the best results. And it was surprising sometimes you were going after a specific target, but then based on the creative and how social um, audiences interpreted those ads, it would be ads that you didn't think would perform would be your highest performing. And the artificial intelligence would put your budget towards the highest performing ads um, to maximize your return on investment. And I thought it was it was fascinating. I think we used them for about six months before I ended up making a career change. But um, ultimately, like that's that's isn't that the, the best part about our job is being able to um, infuse technology into some of our gut and and add the science to it and then really analyze where the success is coming from. And, and when you get those nuggets of a surprise to just now start layering them in on your next campaign. hundred percent. Yeah. I love those. I actually, I really love the ones that were the surprises. Um, and, and when that just reminded us to go back to that, you know, keep your perspective open to see what, to see where things land, let the data tell the truth. Um, yeah. It actually allowed us to start shifting our whole target market. So we thought we had this, 
you know, specific market that we were um, interested in talking to. Uh, and what we learned was actually quite different and um, it, it shifted, it, yeah, it gave us uh, intel to be able to shift a lot of our other marketing channels and tools as well and shift the budget all, um, all over. So. Yeah, and what I've loved from some of those key learnings is the <clears throat> being able to bring those insights from a, the e-commerce perspective and what we learned um, as we got different transactions and different categories that we didn't expect. And then you bring that to your core business. And some of these categories may not be your top performing categories. And all of a sudden you found this market online and then you say, OK, how does that impact our stores? Are our stores in any of these geography geographer? Oh, my gosh, I'm struggling today. The, any of these these areas um, where where we can actually influence the, the assortment mix at those stores that are, um, you know, quite different than our core. And I think if we just take that data and just think about it as e-commerce and we don't translate it to the data that needs to go to our stores where, you know, I still think e-commerce is only representing 15 to 20 percent tops of all retail sales in Canada. So why would we not take our learnings and transform that and translate that to store opportunities? Um, I think is a gap from, from my e-commerce leaders that we're still not comfortable going over and trying to influence what's going on at store. Yeah, I think you make a great point. When we talk about the additive nature of social sort of you know, having transitioned or evolved from that branding to where we are now, that I think one of the other constants has been this uh, this testing and training ground all along. Mm -hmm. you know, it's, it's such a, a um, potentially discreet or finite way to be able to just test an idea, test a concept, test a product, uh, gain that learning, and then, as you say, roll it out. Yeah, I think a lot of people got to get comfortable with that test and learn because there's um, sometimes you don't get that return on investment that you're looking for or, you know, the the impressions that you're looking for. And all of a sudden you start measuring, even though you've gone into the, the, the situation with the intent of testing and learning, you're not getting results right away. So people want to close those campaigns. And it's like, no, we, we went in with this journey saying we're going to test and learn from it. And the greater outcome will be a much higher return on investment if we keep with the strategy instead of bailing on it. And so many times, I know when you start doing your, your KPIs and your weekly reports, you, your leaders above you are not going to understand where why you're spending this money and it's getting a one-to-one -one return. But they have to have the confidence and you got to, as a leader, tell the story to make, nope, let's keep going on this path because we're going to find something that all of a sudden is going to give us a 24-to-1 return. Yeah, I, I, um, I have to say, frankly, that's probably one of my frustrations mm -hmm. um, around data. You're kind of, I think we've been in these places where people will shoot from the hip or they'll talk about their instinct or, you know, their, their N of one examples. And yet when you have the data to be able to prove it, there's um, an automatic inclination often to shoot it down because the results aren't as good as you want them to be but learning is learning um, and I would much rather place my bets or put my my budget on something that is proving results either good successful results or learning that it's not working but let it let it play out as you're saying run its course yeah and I mean I wish there was a better way to measure flyer because I don't know if we'd still be doing print flyers today if we could truly measure them. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, that's a, that we can use another half hour of a topic right there. But um, so let's let's get into. We've got a few minutes left here. Where do you think <clears throat> some of the trends for 2022 will be? Yeah, um, you know, I think uh, looking forward is. Also looking, we need to look backward. I think that this is such an important period of time. And what I'm seeing across a lot of my clients right now is this need to just step back. Um, it's kind of the same thing that what we've been talking about in this conversation, just take stock. Where are we? This doesn't mean that we take a big pause and we slow things down. It's the exact opposite. Yeah. Uh, we can still be running experiments, still be moving things forward, still have a sense of urgency, but have a sense of urgency that's grounded on where are we? Do we have everything we need to, to have? Is this the right time to pivot? Do we have the right infrastructure? Are we using our infrastructure? That's something I come across so often where um, people will invest big sums of money in big um, pieces of equipment. Okay, like Salesforce, perfect example. People invest tons of money in that um, and then just have the 
it's underutilized. So as much as I want to leap into the future, it, it I think serves us to just take pause, mm -hmm. take stock. Where are we? What's working? What's not? What have we got? What do we really need? And what are we going to do with that? Um, and then move forward. And I think kind of everything is old is new again. Uh, I, personalization, key, key, key to what uh, we've got going on in the future. Um, you know, we, we take a look at where we've come out of this, this past couple of years where folks have been sort of forced um, in many instances to move online. Will they stay online mm -hmm. or will they go back to their, uh, their offline, their um, what do you call that thing? <laughs> <In person. laughs> it's been so long. Um, retail experience. And the, I think for me, the personalization, do they get me? Does the brand understand me? Are they delivering on the customer service pro the promise that they said they would? Are they sending me right message at the right time through the right channel? I'll probably stick with them going into the future. Mm -hmm. um, but those that are um, just haven't uh, served that personalization need. I'll probably move away from. Yeah, I, I love the personalization aspect. And I think as retailers, as soon as we can really stop trying to build separate PLs for e-commerce, separate PLs for stores, and really understand that we're just trying to drive sales um, across the organization and let the customer decide which channel they want to shop in. And that's different in my environment because it's a dealer-owned and operated environment here. So we really, really have to be <clears throat> cognizant of not taking traffic and customers away from store level. Um, we want to make sure that we're driving footsteps to store as much as possible. But again, you still have to be customer centric and make sure that you're offering an avenue for consumers to buy, whether it's through their mobile device, a desktop, VR headsets in the future, and then um, obviously within within store and, and make that a seamless experience. And if I think, you know, I had a couple of conversations with Johnny Russo and and he was basically saying, like, if we're doing personalization and it's truly seamless, customers don't even know we're doing it. Yeah. Right? Like, that's that's the key about making sure you're successful is customers have no clue that you're offering up a module that's personalized to them. It's just it's part of the experience and they're just thinking you're that good. Yeah. And <laughs> Um, I think you just made me think about, you know, we need to stop navel gazing. I think so often in, in our environment, particularly retailers, we sort of look across at our neighbors and see what they're doing, uh, whether it's the flyer debate, um, for example, just, and then we just kind of stay within those own, our own confines there versus looking at the best in class examples that are out there. So when we talk personalization, who's doing the absolute best out there? And that then becomes the bar for the customer experience. So how do we start achieving that bar? Because that's ultimately what we're competing against here, right? We're not competing against the other hardware store down the street, for example. We're competing against the best customer experiences, um, which you know could be Amazon, uh, for example. And I love that point. Too often you get stuck in your own siloed environment saying, I'm going to measure myself against all the hardware retailers and you're not taking a look at what Amazon's doing, what Wayfair's doing, what Hay Needle, um, what you name them, you should be mm -hmm. looking at all the competitors um, in a, or all the people in the digital experience world and, and modeling yourself after some of them versus just what the, the closest competition is doing. Because <clears throat> often if you're just looking at each other, then you're like, okay, every, we're, we're just as good as them. But then, two years, three years down the road, you're you're losing margin share to another player because now they're getting into your category. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I, I, I'm i still surprised um, at the number of organizations that have those separate P&Ls, just back to what you were saying a moment ago and mm -hmm. bringing it forward to this part of the conversation because that, that separation is it lacks a holistic view. Right. I'm in my silo and you're in your silo and you're looking at your PL and I'm looking at my PL. We're just not connecting in the right place, which is where the customer is and what the customer is doing and where else they're shopping. Uh, so when I say go back to the basics and look at some of these fundamentals, breaking down those silos, I think, are some of the really important um, jobs to be done now to be able to catapult us into the future. Like that example I was giving about uh, you know, social media. 
really taking the time to take inventory, build out the strategies. The same applies for now looking 2022 and onward. Mm -hmm. Where are we and where are we going? And then that allows us to, to, to leapfrog and move much faster. Yeah. And you touched on a couple of points there. I mean, you know, obviously if you're <clears throat> holistically looking at your business and you're not looking at separate PLs because you're just trying to grow the overall business. So again, it's, it comes back to market share. There's only so much market share that you actually have. You know where you can steal the market share from your competition. But what are those other channels or other markets that are up and coming that you can get into? And then, and then from <clears throat> the foundational piece that you talked about, really, everyone's going back to the foundations and making sure that they have the right systems in place is you may have a roadmap that wants you to be here in five years, but if you don't go back and make sure that the infrastructure that you have in place is going to get you there, you could be building on and, and layering on tools, utilities that you're never going to take advantage of, such as a Salesforce, as you mentioned. The, it always comes with great intentions to roll out a Salesforce platform, but if you don't have alignment across the organization and training across the organization and change management across the organization, then you've just launched a great platform with no plans on how to execute and have a process in place to turn on all of those utilities that they have. A hundred percent. And how many times have we come across scenarios where um, folks are ready to sort of deep six the existing technology? It's sound, it's fine, but they're ready just to, to throw it all away because it wasn't developed according to needs. Um, it doesn't meet the, it's not scalable. It's not future ready. Uh, and so in some cases, it does make sense to just start from scratch and, yeah. and, and go start all over again. You can't, yeah, future, we can't predict for everything, but there are fundamentals that we can align to. I, I agree. And Michelle, <clears throat> we're we're over our time. And I would love for make make sure before we go, though, that um, anyone that's listening right now, um, especially if they need support in 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 your world, knows how to get a hold of you. Ah, awesome. Thank you. Um, yeah, please. Okay, well, you can reach me directly, um, uh, mrk at kulicom.com. That's k u l i c o m.com. Um, I'm also on LinkedIn. And yeah, so read Kulig, you said it right. K u l i g. <laughs> that's fantastic. So that's great. I will also in the description put your contact information uh, for everyone to to get a hold of you. I encourage anyone that's that's been listening to make sure that they they reach out and at least have a an initial conversation. Michelle is like I said, one of the people I respect in the industry. I only spent a very short time. Um, Michelle left quite the impression on me as we we traveled and sat on a panel together. And I'm really lucky to have you on the uh, the podcast with me. I appreciate our our opportunity to catch up tonight and I look forward to doing it again soon. Thanks so much, Chris. It was uh, really fun to be here. I was just getting warmed up. So hopefully we can <laughs> chat again soon. And uh, yeah, I appreciate the plug. I'd be happy to be of service to anyone who needs it. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. You've been listening to Delivering E-Commerce. It's our passion to have on leaders and suppliers in e-commerce from around the globe, setting you and your strategy up for the next level. We hope you've gotten some useful and practical information from the show. Make sure to like, rate, and review, and we'll be back soon. Connect with Chris on LinkedIn at Chris Parsons on LinkedIn and Spotify at Delivering E-Commerce or on YouTube at Chris Parsons Delivering E-Commerce. Till next time, this is Delivering E-Commerce.